Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Elevate Your Business series of webinars co-hosted by Elevate Super and MicroKeeper. I'm Kent from Elevate. Very, very happy and pleased to have Mandy Scott in here with us today to talk about building a human-centered business. But before we dive into that, um, we'll get a few housekeeping items uh, out of the way and do some introductions first. You see on your, your screens the ability to put in questions, chats, comments, and messages. So feel free to do that. We might have some polls along the way too that you can respond to to generate discussion. So we're really, really looking forward um, to having a, a great discussion. This webinar should last about 40 to 45 minutes, including questions. Um, and without so any further delays, I'll just do a quick intro on myself and then hand it over to Stane and also Mandy to kick it all off. So I'm Kent, I'm the uh, CEO of Elevate Super. And, you know, we've partnered with MicroKeeper to uh, host these series of webinars, uh, which we, we are aiming to deliver very interesting content across all sorts of different topics. Um, this is the second in the series. And with that, I'll hand over to Stan from MicroKeeper, my co-host for the series. Thank you so much, Kent. Yeah, my name is Stan. I am a marketing and community leader at MicroKeeper. Uh, we're a software company and people might know us because uh, we have sent a lot of emails and invited a lot of people. So it's great to see everyone uh, joining us today. And like Ken said, we're really in, uh, excited about these series, uh, Elevate Your Business, because we want to go beyond the, just the sales webinar, but really bring people the tools to elevate their business, as it says in the title. So we're really excited to be joined indeed today by Mandy. And without further ado, I'll, I'll hand back over to her and I'll be keeping an eye on uh, the chat that's going on. It's great. To, we've got Nicole, Joseph and Heather already saying hi, so which is great. Um, and I'll be keeping an eye on the chat uh, during the webinar. So please bring your feedback and, and your questions and your, uh, and your answers to questions that Manny might be asking us and I'll uh, keep a close eye on that. Fantastic. Thank you, Stan, and thank you, Ken. I'm so thrilled um, to be joining everyone today. And, yeah, I mean, I guess the topic that we're talking about today is really about elevating your business through the power of your people and really connecting with that. So a very little bit about me. Um, I am the founder of Third Collective, which is a boutique EAP business. I work with growing companies, providing them with EAP services, counselling and mental health education, exactly like kind of what we're what we're doing today. Um, before moving into this space, I've had, I don't know, I think I think the maximum amount of years you can say without sounding too old is about 25 years <laughs> of um, senior leadership experience across the travel industry and the recruitment industry. I keep my hand in a little bit uh, still doing some digital marketing consulting work, so I kind of keep those commercial skills um, pretty, pretty handy. And I also am a researcher and do some work in the academic space as well around sort of psychotherapy therapy and the way humans work. Um, so today we're talking about building a human-centered business, something I'm really passionate about. And as um, Stane mentioned before, we want to make sure that you kind of know where the chat is because I've got some questions for you there. Um, and my first question, which I'd love you to throw the answers into the chat, is think of the best job you've ever had the best job you've ever had and why you loved working there so much. What was it about the organisation, maybe the people, maybe the leadership, but why did you love working there so much? So just throw those um, into the chat. And, yes, I can see a question. What is EAP? <laughs> programs is definitely that. Um, and it's generally like free counselling for your team um, or, and like the individuals in the team, sometimes their families or um, and, and mental health education. And, yeah, it can be a volunteer job, Heather. doesn't have to be a paid-for job, just like the best job you ever had. And, like, you don't have to, to tell the company <laughs> unless you really want to, um, def, you know. But, um, but just why you loved it. What was it about that place that made you love it? As we're waiting for um, the audience to respond, I mean, I, I might offer my my take on that one, I've, I've been pretty lucky and had a lot of quite interesting jobs along the way. But I think one of the ones that really stick in my mind was um, I was working overseas. It was a pretty small team. And in particular, my boss, I suppose, because your boss can make or break a job. That's my experience anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
she she was just wonderful in you know allowing me to to make mistakes i suppose she expected me to make mistakes so that i could grow and learn mm -hmm. and um it was the type of job where um you, you sort of had to make mistakes quite regularly i know it sounds weird but it, it was just that type of job and um with that i, I sort of learned that a completely new mindset and she oh, wow. she always had my back I suppose. Fantastic. I'm hearing a lot there. I'm hearing like safe to make mistakes, challenged, um, yeah. trusted, opportunity for growth. Um, we've got a few more coming through here. Um, someone's still having fun, seeing kids teach each other and learn about themselves. So there's a real sense like that's a bit of a connection to like purpose and meaning, mm -hmm. like doing meaningful work. Um, another one here, love the people, large company with great people. Interesting, pay was poor, but I worked there for six years. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's like, hey, we'll just chuck more money at it because that'll make people happy. But as we'll learn, it's not all about money. Um, best job was the people, the social club, which Heather ran. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, gave me, uh, yeah, so a good budget to organise some great events. Fantastic. And then another one, Tracy said, they're a fabulous manager who mentored me through encouragement and trust. So, you know, those themes are really coming through. Um, let's switch tax. Definitely don't name the organisation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the worst job, the worst job you've ever had. Why? Why do you rate it like that? When you think about it, like, and you get those cold shivers. <laughs> I'm available for counselling later if you need to kind of work through any trauma that this has brought up. But, you know, what the worst job you ever had and why? And just as we move on to that, um, Rowena's added in the best job, ability to learn while helping a business grow and realising its potential. So that's that growth challenge and it sounds like purpose as well. It's seeing something kind of thrive underneath you. So, Kent, do you want to volunteer? <laughs> I, I will, I'll roll into that one too. Look, um, I have to say, you know, I again, I've been lucky. I haven't had any jobs that have been so terrible where I, I've just walked out the door in a sense because I didn't feel like it was an environment for me. Um, but, however, having said that, I have been in jobs where I've seen elements of it where I go, gosh, you know, couldn't that have been done a little bit better or could that work in a, in a much different way? And probably some of the instances that come to mind for me are, um, I think, you know, senior leadership where maybe they operate on a bit of a culture of fear um, in instances. I think that that really sort of made the people around me not be the best that they could be. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think that was probably one sticking point in a particular organization that I worked with previously. Yeah. Had people not being really uh, like available about like what is my work life and what's my personal life. Like they've just been wanting to me to be available all the time. And that's, that's really tough. I think, I think people that know no boundaries and, and really push, you have to be available at work constantly and oh. outside of the hours. That was, that was for me probably one of the worst ones that I've experienced. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Dane. And, like, looking at the chat that's coming through, some pretty similar things there. Um, I'm, I hear the saying, scarred by my boss, being constantly undermined, um, and, and basically just one day just went, I'm done, I'm out. Um, another, an eight-male partner firm in North Sydney where I wasn't allowed to talk with clients, and, yeah. again, that fear thing, you know, middle manager was a tyrant. Um, Rowena said being micromanaged, you know, that's an interesting thing too. It's, it's, it's about that, you know, do you allow people the space to kind of grow um, and to bring their own expertise to the role or are you constantly micromanaging? So, um, Rowena, that's a, a great comment there. And she's also said a lack of team. So, again, some, some common kind of themes coming up. And I guess, you know, that's what we're talking about today. How do you make sure that your business, the one that you are leading, is the next time someone's asked this question, <laughs> you're in the first question, the best job we've ever had, rather than the second. So um, how to actually create an environment, a business where we see people as people, you know, the humans that actually turn up to work every single day and more than just a resource to be used. 
And I think, you know, my understanding is that we've um, predominantly got a lead, leaders here on the call, um, founders, owners, CEOs, people who are responsible um, for their teams. And as the leader, you are instrumental, absolutely instrumental in creating the psychological climate of the organisation. It really does start with you. Is this where we sort of dive into, I suppose, Mandy, the, the meaning of a human-centred business? Yeah. Because that's really um, important, I think. And thank you for everybody who's, who's sort of put in their comments on these two questions. I think it's generated some wonderful insights and discussions. Mm. Uh, but yeah. maybe over to you, Mandy. So what do you mean by a human-centred business? Sure. Well, I mean, it's exactly how it sounds, right? It's about putting the human at the centre rather than just one of a whole bunch of other inputs. Um, and it draws from human-centred design, which a bunch of people might be familiar with. You know, and the key principles of that are, um, number one, empathy. And empathy is that walking in another's shoes, yeah, like really understanding or endeavouring to understand what it is like to live the experience of that human. So empathy, understanding the problem, um, collaboration and engagement. You know, like if we're a design-led organisation, when it, particularly when it comes to customers and designing product, like it's that constant kind of collaboration and test and retest and what's working and where are we getting our results. So it's the same thing within a human-centred business. It's not just like setting a policy and going, right, that's done. That's our new policy, but actually like really engaging around that. And then and then as well as the test and, and feedback opportunity, it's that ongoing iteration and improvement as opposed to oh, there's nothing wrong with our culture. We're fine. We're fine. We put those policies in place three years ago and we don't need to look at them again because, you know, our society is constantly evolving. If you think about the last two years, <laughs> and what's happened like it's a very different working world to what it was two years ago so that ongoing iteration and improvement now I think on the whole businesses are amazing absolutely amazing at doing that around our approach to building products yeah. offering solutions to customers you know you think about all of that stuff like that agile management and da 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 and testing and retesting and customer surveys I mean, you can't buy anything without doing a survey these days um but what about in our teams you know what about in our teams and our organizations and our leadership styles so, you know, if I was to ask everyone here, when you're creating a new product or a new service, something you want to bring to market, what's the first thing you're going to ask is what do our customers want? What do they need? What's most important to them? You're going to put the customer at the center and then build out from there. So my proposition today is that our approach to leadership and how we run our organizations, you know, what we do here is that we need to hold that idea central as well, that we need to put the needs and the wants of our people at the absolute centre. And if we don't do that, then we can't really consider ourselves to be a human-centred business. Thank you, Mandy. I think, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a wonderful way to look at it because certainly I, I, I probably speak for you know, some other organizations, right? We, we spend so much time, like you say, on, on, you know, designing products, services, you know, trying to achieve the best that we can for what our customers want. But applying that thinking to, to our own team, mm. we, we all clearly have the skill set to do it for our customers. <laughs> so why not do it um, sort of for our own team as well? Um, but how do we go about doing that, Mandy? What's, what's the way, you know, that you would suggest to sort of team leaders and what have you to start going through that process? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first place to start is to really get an understanding of what humans actually need. You know, that's where we need to start. And we've kind of like started to touch on that just with those opening questions, best job, worst job, you know, really what you were connecting with there was what did I need? What, what mattered to me? So having said that, 
the question of human motivation, human needs, is a very big question. <laughs> and, you know, psychologists um, and even Siri is wanting to engage in it. <laughs> psychologists and philosophers have been trying to answer that question, you know, since the start of time. Um, we only have 30 to 40 minutes today, so <laughs> we're going to keep it fairly contained. We can really only touch the surface, but let's do a quick poll. So Stane's going to pop up a poll um, for you to answer, and the question that I'm asking you here, what are the most important things to you about work? Now, how many can people choose, Stane? Well, there should Has be unlimited responses. Or? Yeah, they should okay. be able to give unlimited responses. So if it doesn't pop up for you on the screen, then just look at the place where you see chat and there is a should be a poll section there as well. Um, and we have uh, started that now. So if I'm you can navigate. Three, choose three, because if you all choose them all. <laughs> that might be a bit too much. <laughs> So choose your top three most important things to you about work, interesting work, sense of purpose and meaning, pleasant working conditions, recognition, responsibility, money, job security, status, um, personal and skill development and growth, advancement opportunities, work that is aligned with my values and a company with clear policies and procedures. Yeah, cool. And I see the, uh, the answers are rolling in, so it's... Uh... It is working, so it's, it will be very, very interesting to see if it will be a bit aligned with our expectations because we've obviously discussed this a little bit beforehand. Yeah. Yes, have. And I yeah. probably should add, um, and Tracy's made a great point, actually, which I'm, I am going to uh, come to, that these do change over time, for sure, for sure. They absolutely do change. Um, mm. Rowena's wanting to know how to select them. Um, do you just, like, good... click it? You should be able to click them. Like the, the hard thing is, I don't necessarily have the same view because I'm operating the poll, so I'm not I think, uh, sure. Rowena, because it is a long list, you may have to scroll down to click submit, the submit button. Ah, uh, yes, you do. Right at the bottom. You do. So yeah. I had to, I had to try and find that too. <laughs> Thanks for that input. Uh, do you guys see the results as well, or do you want me to run? I think we need to share more? the results, actually. I'm just going to say while Stane's doing that, this is probably not like a, you know, from a research perspective, it's, <laughs> it's not going to be a representative sample because if we do tend to have more sort of a leadership team, it's going to be a different kind of um, uh, answer to, yeah. But, okay, fantastic. I found the results. It's very exciting. Um, cool. So 19% equal top is interesting work and sense of purpose and meaning. Yep. Um, interestingly, pleasant working conditions has come up pretty high there as well um, with recognition. Oh, hang on, actually. Da, 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 da. A, skill and, a skill and development, that's come up at 10% and opportunities for advancement. And then another one that's really high is work that aligns with my values. So um, interesting work, purpose and meaning, top two, followed by work that aligns with my yeah. values and pleasant working. Pleasant working. That yeah, kind of surprises yeah. me a little bit. And then skill development and growth and opportunities for advancement yeah. are next. Amazing. Interestingly, that clear policies and procedures, which is where HR teams spend a lot of their time was mm. the lowest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if, you're, if your HR team is spending all their time on policies and procedures, um, you might you might want to just have a think about that because that is the least meaningful um, for people, certainly in this audience today. Um, so just on that, if you've done any kind of management sort of 101 training when you've talked about human motivation you probably heard about Hertzberg's two-factor theory of motivation um, and in that theory he talked about motivating factors and hygiene factors now Often in the management textbooks, it's just like this kind of like Hertzberg theory, two theories, hygiene factors, motivating factors, hygiene are like external, motivating factors are in, intrinsic. But actually the study was kind of an accident. They weren't looking for human motivation. They were looking for the effect, they were looking for the effect of working conditions on productivity, I think. 
Mm -hmm. um, so working conditions and productivity, and they were using lighting as the mechanism for testing that. So it was a factory. They got like a small group of people. The rest of the factory was the control group. They took a small group of people. And with that smaller group of people, they played with the lighting. And the really interesting thing that came from the study was it kind of didn't matter how bad the lighting got. Like they kept reducing the lighting. <laughs> Productivity kept going up. I like this, this, this. This is not testing my hypothesis. There's something <laughs> wrong here. Mm. And, and with further research and investigation, what they realised was by taking this small group of people, people felt more connected. They were mm. getting more attention and more recognition. They were able to kind of engage and communicate more directly with their team and, and like, they kind of felt special because we're in this special group. So they came to discover that actually... Human motivation is less about what's happening out there and more about what's happening in, in here and sort of this idea of two, this two-factor theory. So the external factors, hygiene is a funny word, right? I tend to think about bathrooms when I think about the word hygiene. Um, but hygiene or external factors, they are things like salary, even status, status is an external factor. Your office is an external factor. I was kind of a little bit surprised that nice working conditions came up high there. Um, and, and, and what those factors do is they increase or decrease dissatisfaction. Right. Right. So if you, whereas it's the internal factors, the intrinsic motivating factors, which are things like interesting work, challenging work, um, uh, feeling like I'm part of a team, feeling like I belong, feeling like I'm valued, um, that my values and the organisation's values are kind of connected. They're the sort of motivating factors. So they're where we need to put our attention on. And I think about a business I was involved with a few years ago, um, I was with an organisation, we were growing through acquisitions and my role as Executive General Manager was I was working with the companies that we acquired. And this one particular company, I cannot tell you, we named the office The Bunker because it was like this office was like almost underground, <laughs> with no natural light. Um, it was little like working in a jail cell. It was like tiled floors, um, like just there was absolutely no vibe in this space whatsoever. Um, there was no niceties in this place. You had to bring, if you're an employee, you had to bring your own tea bags. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Wow. The company didn't even organise tea and coffee. I had never met a bunch of more engaged and loyal employees in my entire life wow. because the owner of this business was so committed to each of those people as individuals. He would help out them when they needed help. He would hire people that no one else would touch and he would work with them and develop them. Like the loyalty and engagement that this business owner had was incredible, despite the fact that you had to bring your own tea bag. And that for me was a real example of this kind of intrinsic versus hygiene factors you know and we spend so much time particularly like the startup you know we've got to have the cool office and the, yeah. you know, the tennis table yeah. breakfast and, bar you know, the breakfast like the scoop whatever you yeah. know yeah. yes great people love it and that certainly came up here but more importantly is the relationship and the connection that you're building um, with your people and does that change over time, Andy? You know, the, the intrinsic factors that people have. I can think back on when I started my career through to now, I've probably changed my mindset somewhat or a lot, actually. Totally. And, totally. and how, do, how do leaders sort of work with that? And how are there some commonalities despite, you know, different careers and, and different um, stages of careers? Look, you could definitely, you could generalise for sure. Yeah. But I think the best way to know is to know, 
is mm. to, you know, um, to make sure that you, I mean, you know, if you're in a big organisation, you're not going to be able to sit down and have coffee with every single person in your team. But if you're creating a culture where you know your managers and you say to your managers, you need to know your people. You know, I, I when I was, um, I heard a saying, when it was all about the whole Gen Zs, I think we kind of moved on, but it was like, if you don't know what your Gen Z employee is doing on the weekend, you're not close enough to them. So it's that real like building those relationships internally so you know what's going on for people. You know, I think back to myself um, when I was in my commercial career, um, I was a single mum, I was paying a mortgage, I had private school fees to pay. So I can tell you job security, salary and flexibility were right up there for me, Hmm. right up there for me. But had either one of those dropped and the relationship within the business, if I didn't feel trusted, if I didn't feel challenged, then I would have perhaps looked for work elsewhere. You know, so those three things were kind of non-negotiables. But for that true engagement, I needed to have the other stuff happen. Now, I'm at a different time in my life now where, you know, I don't have those same financial burdens. I'm, I'm back studying, researching, exploring a whole lot of other things. So, you know, for me to go back into, say, a full-time work experience, it would be a really different things that would pull me back. So, yes, it definitely changes over, over life stage. And that question came up in the chat a little earlier but I think I think there's like five six Mm. (laughs) key things um, that are real takeaways around what do people need what will people really engage with and the first one there is I matter you know I matter I need to feel that my organisation has a worthwhile purpose that came up in our conversations and I need to know how my tasks contribute and matter to that. You know, there is a purpose to my job. There is a purpose for me turning up every day and I'm, I'm making a contribution. The second one there is I belong. And I think that's so powerful. This is like a deep, deep intrinsic thing for humans the need to belong Um, I need to feel part of something bigger than me I need to see my workplace the workplace values ring true and that they're widely shared as the foundation of a vibrant workplace culture for me this is why diversity is not just a box to be ticked but it really, really, really matters at all levels of the organisation that there is wide representation so that everybody feels like they belong Mm -hmm. because that is key. That is key to, you know, really pulling people together. And, you know, let's face it, if we're growing a business, you know, you're asking, if you like, ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And if people feel a sense of belong and team, They'll, they'll go more than the extra mile. And maybe has it been easier or harder with the, you know, with the pandemic and people working remotely? I imagine yeah. some organisations that, you know, the, the making their staff feel like they belong, that's been a challenge because of how they've set themselves up to work remotely. Yeah. I think it's made it harder. Mm. But those organisations that are really committed to it have been able to do a really good job about it because feeling like you belong doesn't necessarily mean that you turn up to the same place every day, Mm. right? Mm. So we can kind of, uh, it feels easier when we're all turning up to the same place every day. But if through, you know, the way that we communicate, the way that we connect, um, you know, checking in with people, calling people and, and perhaps allowing now that as we're moving back into that more kind of, um, you know, actually in physical places again, being really open to conversations about how do people want to do that. You know, I think yeah. it's important. So, yeah, I think it has been harder because mm. the illusion of belonging by turning up to the same place every day has yes. kind of been removed and yes. the reality of that culture has kind of been, um, yeah. yeah, stripped back, I guess. Um, another need is that sense of being enabled, that I have access to the tools and the information and the processes to do my work. I know what's needed to be done. I know 
how decisions get made and then I'm kind of given the resources that I I need I know where I need to go when I need help but at the same time I'm left to get the job done if I'm if I'm good with that I I used to have a boss who I used to joke he would always give me enough rope to hang myself (laughs) but always I knew that you know when I came close to that I could I could step in and ask the questions Um, I contribute is really important. People love to have their accomplishments recognised. I need to know that my teammates appreciate and value my contributions. There is nothing more powerful than when your team member gives you a great idea that you take that to your boss by saying, Mandy, in my team, this is her idea, it's amazing, and and then your boss recognises that person rather than you representing that idea as your own. Um, I'm respected. People need to feel respected. And that opportunity of trust where, you know, information is confidently and confidently and appropriately shared. And the final one, I am safe. Mm -hmm. I am safe. What do you mean by by safe, Mandy? Do you mean, I suppose, you know, is it a physical thing? Is it more than more than that? Yeah, and, and I'm not just talking like my job is safe, you know, like job security. What I mean is psychological safety. Um, being able, being feeling safe to express my views. Um, having the trust that I'll be recognised for the work that I do, that I'm seen as a whole person, that I don't have to just put my only positive vibes on here face to turn up to work every day. Um, A definition of psychological safety that I want to share with you is an environment where you feel included, that it is safe to learn and contribute and that you can challenge the status quo all without any fear of being shamed, embarrassed or marginalised. Now, guy called Timothy Clark came up with that. Don't know who he is, um, but I thought it was awesome. <laughs> you know, all of that without any fear of being shamed, embarrassed or marginalised. Are there some good examples of organisations that you may have come across, Mandy, where they don't do this well? We'll, we'll turn it the other way, where they don't, where they, you know, their the normal practices just genuinely make their staff feel not safe. Um It'd be good to understand some of those ones, just in case any of those happen across any other organisations that we're involved with and we can pick up on those. And Yeah. Look, I think these are, I think these are really subtle, hmm. right? Like most, most organisations are pretty good at, you know, dotting the T's or not, you know, dot T's, so you dot I's and you cross T's. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly details not one of my strengths. Um, you know, so that there is appearance yeah. of everything's good. Um, you know, one, one of my examples, I, I had a boss, I was a boss for a long time, um, who was all about, you know, we're all about the team. We make, I was on the scene, I was the only woman on the senior leadership team. We're all about the team. We make decisions t- together, blah, blah, blah. And then he'd ask for your feedback and you just knew <laughs> that he really had already made his mind up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so it kind of got to the point where I was like, well, is there really any point kind of yeah. saying what I think? Because I know he's already made his mind up. I'm not going to be listened to anyway. So you kind of check out. Mm. So it's not like I felt that I was going to be, you know, um, in trouble for having a different opinion, but I also knew there wasn't much point. Mm-hmm. Um, so potentially he didn't get the best value from me hmm. um, because after a while I was like, you're yeah. not going to listen. You're not going to listen anyway. So. Yeah, no, that, that's a great example. I wonder if there's another one. I think I, I just picked up on what you were saying when you said, you know, and certainly I, I felt this as well um, as a team leader or as a, a senior exec in the organisation, you, you sort of feel like you have to turn up and be positive every day. You can't have a bad day in a way, right? But we all know we all have bad days. Yes. Good days. So, you know, are senior executives actually letting the team down in a sense by trying to show the team that they're always having a good day? I think so. I mean, you know, there's a whole conversation around authenticity, you know, empathy and authenticity. Um, If you want to build real empathy with people, you need to have... Uh, you, you need to be able to connect with emotion. 
Mm. And you need to be comfortable with emotion. Now, in my teams in recent years, one of the things I do before every team meeting is have a check-in. And at the start of the meeting, the check-in is, how are you today, really? And you're not allowed to use the word good or fine. You have to come up with another word. Now, that also does another thing because it expands your emotional vocabulary. If you have to move away from good and fine, and actually I would, great wasn't an option either. Um, You could say, I am feeling fantastic. And then you might, because, you know, this has happened, this has happened. But it's like, actually, I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. And then it's an opportunity to go, so what does the rest of the team need to do to support you? And when you can be courageous enough as a leader Mm. to say, you know what, there's a lot going on for us right now. And I've got to say, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. What that's going to mean is I'm going to be really task orientated over the next week. Mm. And I'm going to apologize in advance. (laughs) Because we've got these deadlines we need to meet and we've just got to get on with it. So that's where I'm at right now. Like people will respect that. Mm -hmm. I've also said to teams, you know, because I'm not suggesting every meeting and every decision needs to be like by committee, right? That's very inefficient. I've said to teams, listen, today, this week, this is not a democracy. This is a benevolent dictatorship. I'm making the call. If it's wrong, we'll reevaluate. So it's more about that transparency and authenticity and, you know, and when you make a mistake, you own it. Mm. Is that something that you, Mandy, that you've, like with the work you've done and with leaders in particular, like I I can imagine that that being vulnerable and emotionally vulnerable is, is hard for a lot of people. How do, what tips might you have for people that are in leadership to open themselves up and, or maybe even things that you've lived through, how that actually affects how people see you as a leader uh, if you are more vulnerable than you might be? Because a lot of people, maybe in our crowd as well, might Mm. be just have that top-down mentality of, okay, I have to be the strong leader and be seen as the captain that kind of is stern and goes down with the ship in a sense. Yeah. We confuse the idea of strength with... Um, stoic Mm. no it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to admit a mistake you know it takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage to ask for help now I'm not suggesting that you you know turn your team meetings into group therapy sessions right Um, but it's it's so you you know you're still going to maintain a degree of, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a therapy session. But, you know, when you don't know, when you've made a mistake, when you're finding things challenging, you know, it could be like I'm finding things really challenging, so I guess that probably everybody else in this team is, is feeling really challenged as well. So I thought maybe we'd have some time together and we'd talk through what's actually going on mm-hmm. and how we can better support each other. Um, so... I, it, it's it's more about that connecting with that courage to be open. Um, and conversely, you know, if somebody comes to you in your team and they're having a really tough time, be that in work or outside of work, getting comfortable with difficult emotions. You know, if somebody starts crying, being like rather than telling them to stop crying, oh, no, sorry, I made you cry, be like, oh, like this is really difficult for you right now, isn't it? Like actually give people permission to feel what they're feeling rather than having to kind of bottle that all up Um, because emotions are just energy and they're going to come out somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know. So like I said, I'm not suggesting group therapy sessions at work, but I am suggesting just bringing in that little bit of authenticity and allowing the humanness to come into our workplaces because, you know, if you try to push down fear and anger and all of those things, you're also pushing down joy and happiness and excitement, you know, you, like, yeah, you can't just switch some off and not others. Yeah. And, and for the organisations that do get it right, Mandy, has there been any sort of research on what, what impacts that has on, you know, the staff, the organisation? Yeah. 
Yeah, I found some research from a Gallup research that said um, improving psychological safety in an organisation can see a 27% reduction in turnover, a 40% reduction in safety in incidents and a 12% increase in productivity. Now, if you kind of go back to just that simple safety of it's okay to make a mistake here, mm. right? It's okay to make a mistake here. Um, you are more likely to tell your boss, yeah, look, there's a little bit of a problem. We might need to do something about it. You know, it could mean that people in the, I don't know, <laughs> in the factory might trip over. I don't know. But do you know what I mean? If there's that, we all know that you can fix a mistake quick. Like the more quickly you can fix a mistake, the less expensive it is, right? Mm. Um, creating a culture where people feel okay to say what's really going on. Mm. And I think um, Stan just popped something up on the chat. We are coming <laughs> to a uh, forty-minute mark already, so please, please feel free to pop in any other questions from the audience if you have anything from Andy. Um, in the meantime, I think um, you know. Obviously, we, we wanted to thank Mandy for her time um, and sharing all these interesting insights with us. I, I personally have one final question in case, but I'll just see if there's anyone else who wants to ask a question first wow. in the chat. Let them have a have a go first. If you want to start with yours, it's absolutely I'll fine. Mine, we're waiting. How about that? I'll, I'll have some Mandy, too. So um, sorry. Yeah, as a leader uh, in the organisation that, you know, that I'm involved with, what, what's the one thing that you would say to me um, to really, really focus on uh, in terms of building a human sense? What's that one piece of advice that you would leave me with? Yeah, it would be get to know your people, mm. like really get to know them and what matters to them yep. um, and make it okay for people to make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. I think yeah, that's absolutely that's brilliant. Think. And you said before, how do we know if we're getting it right? I want to go right back to the start. This is an ongoing process of iteration, feedback. Um, it's it's a journey for ourselves as leaders and, mm. and actually as humans, whether it's in our relationships at work, our relationships with our families, with our friends, you know, the, the process of being a psychologically safe human is an ongoing process and you will not get it right every time. Yeah. Um, it's like with parenting, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, my God, I just sounded like my mother. <laughs> um, but if you can then go to your kid and be like, you know, like, mommy's really sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you like that. There's no harm done. You've, in fact, you've built a closer relationship because you've acknowledged that you're not perfect. That's awesome. Maybe, maybe just before, if there's if there's no other ones that, that roll in, uh it, I always like to know like things that we definitely need to avoid. Like if there's like a big one thing that you see that you might be through your work that you might see working with, with certain businesses that you see, look, these are red flags and really we, you want to not do this. Is there like one or two that come up immediately? Look, it's really interesting working in the employee assistance program um, when businesses are going through really stressful times, then often I get more of the team come through for one-on-one -on -one sessions. And often it's like, I'm so stressed, like, duh, like the, the, the level of stress is really high. Hmm. Um, and so it's like, well, you know, we'll send you through to the employee assistance program to make you feel better. <laughs> Or, you know, we'll do the yoga and cupcakes, you know, let's get the yoga mm. teacher in and do some cupcakes. When actually the business is under-resourced, um, there's not enough bodies to do the amount of work you want to get done. Mm. Um, people are being asked to go, like, way beyond what is perhaps humanly possible. So these things are really important, but if, you're, if your team are not well-resourced, um, then, then that's one. And then the other one is if you have any leaders that are demonstrating any of those qualities that we talked about around worst job, they're managing by fear. They might be great at managing up, but when it comes to managing down, they're a tyrant. They need to go. Mm. Don't muck around with that because it will yeah. do too much damage both to that's your organisation and to the individual's. I just think of the turnover alone would be horrible. Just like there's people that leave just for that reason alone. Yeah. We've got a question from Electra. Um, also, before we before we go to the question, 
there was also a really funny thing that uh, that Nicole said before about the person that was asking questions but not listening to the answers. She's called she called him an asshole, someone who asks your opinion but doesn't listen to the answers. So I thought we'd, uh, for the people who are uh, seeing this later in the recording, they don't see the chat. So I just wanted to, to include that little bit of gold. That's excellent. Yeah, Electra's question about the metaverse, will it improve work from home human relationships? Um, do you know what? I think humans are humans everywhere. Mm. So whether they're in a virtual space, in a in real life space, in the metaverse, humans are humans <laughs> everywhere. They're going to bring their stuff everywhere. So I don't. It, it will only improve if the humans themselves are actually focused on becoming better um, at connection, at relationships, at being safe, at being safe, of listening, of empathy. Um, I don't think the actual platform is really going to shift it that much. Mm -hmm. So you get a good answer for that. So yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think we do, we do have another question and, and maybe yeah. maybe the final question, I suppose, we're um, quartered to already. Uh, but I think it's a great question perhaps to end on is, um, can you suggest a book, book on this topic to read, Mandy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm a big Brené Brown fan. Um, when I grow up, I want to be Brené Brown. Um, I would suggest checking out, she has a book, Dare to, Dare to Lead, which kind of summarises a lot of her stuff from her other books. All of her stuff's really good. She talks a lot about empathy, shame, being authentic, being an authentic leader. I would definitely point you in that direction. Yes. Thank you. Well, with that, we might close the webinar. And again, thank you, Mandy, thank for you. joining us on this uh, webinar. I've personally learned uh, a lot of interesting sort of tips and snippets on, you know, what, what we should do as leaders and what we can do more for our team. So that's been very, very highly valuable. Um, and and Stain, I think um, we've got uh, our next webinar planned. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm currently. In do you want to share some information on that if you're able to? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we we do want to talk a little bit about uh, digital disruption. Uh, I think that's really interesting. So we always try to have like the soft, softer topics and a bit of the harder topics, uh, so that we really give people the tools to to elevate their business in as many ways as possible. And uh, yeah, digital is, is really, especially after COVID has disrupted the way we work and just want to hear from some people, okay, how does the future look? How has how has digital helped certain businesses and how can we uh, go in the future? So we'll, we'll hear from some people trying to get together a panel of people. So we hear like a few different uh, voices in that in that uh, discussion can give people some ideas and some insights and we we're trying to also keep it uh at a very beginner level so that people who have never heard of anything digital can still uh take a, a few uh takeaways from it so there's uh there's really i'm really already excited with the people i'm, I'm speaking to so that will probably will be happening towards the end of uh, april uh, and then in May, we're, we are taking a bit of the road over about uh, what we're doing for the end of financial year. So we're helping businesses get ready for end of financial year. And I've also already started speaking to some uh, potential speakers there with, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and, and hopefully we can, we can help some people with some actionable insights there as well. Thank you, Stane. And Mandy, um, did you want to share any sort of website contact details in case anyone in the audience wants to reach out or find out more about your organization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my website is thirdcollective.com.au. Um, my email is mandy at thirdcollective.com.au and third is spelt T-H-I-R-D um, as opposed to the number. And you can also find at Third Collective, I think there's a hyphen or a dash in the middle there, um, on Instagram on there as well. And Excellent. LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Come find me. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> um, so thank you so much again um, for everyone uh, spending your time with us uh, today. And I hope everyone's found it useful, as useful as Stan and I have found it, I'm sure. And uh, with that, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, everyone, for thank attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.